Welcome to the Parish Art Museum podcast, where we aspire to provide opportunities for learning, sharing, and celebrating the many innovative and pioneering artists who call the East End home. Come back each week to find new and impactful experiences in the arts. I just want to say, if that's the pilot, I can't wait for the film. I have rarely seen such, you know, as someone who has worked and thought about Keith's work for a long time, this is incredible to have you yeah. the center Thank of this. It, it really, really is. And Okay. So how do we go on with Well, I, I have a question first. Sure. Both. How did you meet? <laughs> Me and Lana? Yeah, yeah. Well, the funny thing is, Lon and I go back a long time. Yes. Well, I, I seem to remember she that. She's a young girl. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. Right. yes. Yeah. No, Keith's daughter is the goddaughter one of one of my closest friends from way back. Unfortunately, he's passed away. His name is Lorenzo Wiseman, whom I knew when he was at Harvard. Right. And Keith's daughter, Olympia, is Lorenzo's goddaughter. So that's one connection. And the other connection was through your ex-wife, Nessia Pope, who's yeah. also Brazilian, right. and I grew up in Brazil. Right. And then through the third, and through the art world. Right. Out here. Yeah. yeah. So you met, well, uh, how old is Olympia? Olympia's quite a while 30. ago. Okay. So quite a while ago. Well, I think yeah. the, your relationship, I mean, it comes through in the, and the easy way. you in our relationship in a lot of different ways. Okay. You know, we've been abreast of other things that have happened in mutual friends in uh, our community, in our lives. Sure. Yeah. Particularly here in the Hamptons? Particularly here, because mm -hmm. I ended up moving here and spending more time there. But I used to see Alana in New York when I was living there. OK. Well, let me ask Alana, how, what, what, what inspired you to embark on this? Well, first of all, I, when I first met Keith way back uh, with Nessia, I mean, they were considered one of the most beautiful, handsome couples, as well as interesting and talented. So I was actually, in those days, I was brought up to the Hamptons by Andy Warhol, okay. whose film I edited and then subsequently did a documentary on Andy. And through Andy, I met Larry Rivers, Chamberlain, and a lot of the artists who were working out here. And Keith came a little later than that. And since I was basically interested in making films on uh, artists, of course, I've always loved the idea that Keith had this very original work on with Neon, yes. which I didn't know that much about. But I was, so with time, I just found out more and more about his work. And uh, I approached him saying, it would be great to make a film on his Neon work. So. Um, One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I started. <laughs> well, uh, Lana, I'm sure most of you know as this extraordinary compendium of films that you have made on artists. I am just, I'm thrilled that you captured that moment of the flocking of the Oldsmobile, which would have to go down in the annals right. of art history as one of the most extraordinary moments. Right. Keith, but we've... Keith might be able to tell you a little more about this art collector, John Walsh. Yes. And it's pretty interesting how he... Right. Tell them about the story very of the very interesting that I, I think I was approached by... Uh, definitely another collector artist friend. And he says, look, there's this guy, John Marsh, who owns about 230, 40 cars. And he likes to get artists to decorate them, either through signature or painting or some way. And I said, well, there's only one thing I'd be interested in doing with a car. It's a fancy I've had about the automobile since I, I drove very early. At 13, I was driving in Louisiana. Legally. Legally, which was normal. <laughs> I had a farmer's license. Right. And I would, would go anywhere. It was amazing. So I met the guy. I met uh, Jonathan. And we hit it off. And he understood. And I said, now look, since I left Louisiana in the late uh, 60s, I still remember these wonderful old cars, like the old Oldsmobile and Buicks I loved. And my friends as kids, we drove them because we could drive at 13. And this provided a very different vision of not only the countryside, but of 
vision and movement and perception, which, you know, was not there. I mean, I was at the Met the other day and to see these paintings, before we saw those kinds of paintings, there was nothing to refer to. You're talking about the Delacroix. I'm talking about show. the Delacroix show. So well, you Lana's idea of wanting to do this was very environmentally progressive. Mm -hmm. That she thought, well, wh how would we do this? I said, well, look, we have to get Larry to get the car, flock the car, and prepare it for you to be able to shoot. And it was on a moment's notice almost. We had yeah. to rush right. to and the garage. Right, and this is the collector, Larry Warsh. Yes. Yeah. Larry Warsh. And he was, yeah. is an oh, excuse eccentric. Me. I thought it was John Warsh. Yes. yes. Larry. John or Larry? Larry. Larry. It's Larry Warsh, Warsh. not John Warsh. Okay. Okay. Right, right. So that came about, and we got the old car. And through his body shop where he painted cars, we flocked the old car. Now, and for those of us who might not know what flocking means, <laughs> is everyone clear on that? No. Oh, good. I had to go to YouTube, so. Flocking, flocking. is an old, really a, even 18th century material that was first used, I think, in France in the production of wallpaper and book publishing. It was, uh, the French were very always involved in printmaking and books and experimenting with new textiles and uh, printing techniques. And it's from my trips to France that I noticed it being printed because I had used it in a small way, printing or covering African art, which I collected mainly from Belgian collectors, or one collector in Munich, who were mother and son. So I developed an interest in the material, and as soon as I flocked the mask, it became the most mysterious and bizarre image. It looked like it came from out of space. And I thought, so, I've, got, I've got to do more of these. Flocking is actually material that's sort of... It's shredded. Shredded red. or pulverized. Or you've seen little and boxes. And it's like you powder. With a sort of you buy a bag of flocking, it's like a bag of gray powder. Mm -hmm. And it's shredded red and it doesn't stick together. It has to stick to a sticky surface. Well, that's why the surface of the cough felt like felt. Yes. Right. So when you look at the car or even touch the car, it looked like it was floating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this, what Lana kept coming on, that it's like a ghost image. It's like it's moving. And we flocked it, and then we realized, well, it needs light, too. Mm -hmm. So I put neon light in the car, and all of a sudden, it just became this amazing, magical object which leaned very well to film me. And you have written about that those early yes. days and 13, right. and I don't know how yeah. late you were allowed to stay out, but right. you've written about driving back across yeah. the bayou yeah. and seeing the right. juke joints with yeah. the neon and that impression. Yes, yes, which was quite amazing. And so it all ties yeah. together with that. And my mother and her sisters uh, growing up with them, they were a very unique group of women at that particular era. They all had unique kinds of interests and positions. One of my aunt was a, a big funder of the leper colony. There was still leprosy in America in a lot of places. And leprosy in the end was cured by penicillin. Mm -hmm. But they had done research in Louisiana because we still have a marsupial, an earth bearer, and they thought the marsupial might offer the key to solving leprosy. In the end, it was not the marsupial, but in fact, it was penicillin, which altered all our lives. Yeah. Now, I, I, that particular leper colony was one that was sort of on a bend in the yeah, in the River, Mississippi. Right, yes. in the Mississippi, and you would go, because and bodies could be buried. My aunt would insist yeah. on yeah. us going, because yeah. we're going to, to the leper colony. And she's, come on. 
Leprosy's been here since the beginning of time. Haven't you read your Bible? We're off to the leper colony. I have to bring them this material. I bring it every year. Stop it. So we drove off to the leper colony. We get to the leper colony, and it's an old plantation, but the slave quarters of the leper colony had been renovated and beautifully fixed and became the, uh, col the leper colony. So we would go to the leper colony, sit down with the lepers, and my aunt would discuss what more they needed and that kind of stuff. And so this was, you know, an amazing thing with one of my aunts. My other aunt was a famous welder. She welded on the U-boats that went to Normandy. That's how she started, and later on she became a nurse. But each one, I had another aunt who ran a gambling casino. <laughs> and I love the gambling casino. Because <laughs> you'd walk to the island and you'd Did it have hear. to be offshore? It was offshore. Sure, because it wasn't legal onshore. Yeah, that yeah. And I had an aunt that did that. Yeah. <laughs> you'd hear the, the machinery, like the roulette wheel going. And my aunt was run the roulette wheel. Her husband was literally could have been Stuart Granger. He looked like Stuart Granger. Mm -hmm. and, but my aunt's name was not Tootsie, as in the film. Tootsie. Tootsie. She was called Tootsie in the French. Hey. And so we would go to the, the gambling casino. As kids, and I would see the gambling setup, and I had watched them make this same setup as a kid because my teacher in Mamu made them. He the wheels themselves. He made the wheels, the grafting. <laughs> he was a school teacher who taught carpentry and who had worked in Morocco, and everybody was bilingual there, so he spoke French and English. Right. I think there's, there's to complete a, this film, yeah. you need just, to go to There's yeah. a Mamou. whole documentary yeah. with all this background that yeah. Yeah, yeah. could come out or should come out. But what, um, Keith, you've talked about a form language that runs throughout. You mentioned it in the film that right. runs throughout. And certainly the driving in the car across the yes. neon. This I was intrigued. And, and the film shows so beautifully the process. Yes. And the drawing and the yeah. copper tubing. and. I'm going back to wonder, did you see a newspaper photograph of the Ebola virus? Did you see that image somewhere? It was in the paper mm -hmm. All right. at the time. And at that point, my eyes were good, so I saw a lot of television. Okay. And I saw it on television, and I thought, well, God, this looks like a neon to you. <laughs> because it was the two colors. It was blue neon, which is argon neon, yeah, yeah. and red neon, which is the color of neon. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was an early inspiration for the material. Interesting. And then I actually had talked to Lana about this. I said, you know, we should flock the car. <laughs> and then this collector, Mr. Mark, said, look, I'll pay for flocking the car finding the car, and getting the person to do it. And it's Lana's footage of this that is one part of this wonderful little film. Uh, brilliant. The, yeah. Where is that car now? I think we he has it in his collection. He has, as I said, about 230, cars. He has a collection of all his automobiles. Wow. That would be some show, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> an interesting guy. But actually those, those the drawings of the small drawings yeah. look very much like the vi the virus. Yes, and they do. Exactly the shapes and the colors. Absolutely. Yeah. Did that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what And that's what brought it. But I was lucky as a kid that my parents both were of a liberal nature and a, of an eccentric nature. Mm -hmm. And it made for a very different kind of upbringing, unbeknownst to their 
knowledge anyway. My parents were both Catholics, but they were very friendly with the a group of nuns there, Dominican nuns who wore the white garb and who... And the great headdress. And the great, great headdress. Remember the and flying one, nun? Yeah. Those, those I had one a of the sister. South Louisiana nuns. Right. There. One yeah, of these wonderful. nuns taught very early on the Montessori method. Hmm. And she was this amazing little woman. She was probably, you know, below five feet. And she became very friendly with my parents, and she would tell her mother, now, look, I think that you should be singing in the choir with uh, the black choir. And the Canadian priest who schools them says you would be excommunicated as Catholics anyway from going there and not being part of the community. <coughs> so... We had the Canadian priests mm -hmm. who excluded, had this exclusion about black. But when it came time for the communion, he told my mother, now you will have communion with the general population. And my mother said, well, it's not going to quite work that way. <laughs> I'm having a communion with my black sisters mm -hmm. that I'm singing with. He says, we don't do that. She says, in this ball game, we do. <laughs> and she sang in Latin. Yes. She, you know, I went to Catholic college right. with Sisters of Charity, yes. you know, square. Oh, yes. And religious. Yeah. And I was, always, I was always curious to see whether I could see any of the hair sticking out. Right. You know? yeah. So we have that Catholic. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Well, you always had strange. curiosity about what yeah. was underneath, right? right? Yes. So it was yeah. very interesting that that happened. And talk, it, talk a little bit about, you know, in the film we heard about English being not your first language. Right. But, uh, um, well, as a kid growing up, we always sort of relied on our patois if they really wanted to make a point clear. <laughs> Both my parents would addressed me in Patois, but they knew it was Patois. And my mother said, well, eventually you're going to go to France and learn real French. So, man, I thought, you go going to Paris. <laughs> and I was so ready to get on the plane and go to Paris, but it wasn't my mother's plan. She said, you know, first you go and get rid of that Cajun French. You're going to go and stay in this old chateau where they make seed boucher, which is actually apple cider, oh. bubbled apple cider. And, and they, they also make calvados, okay. which oh, is wow. a very strong liqueur made mm -hmm. from apples. And this connection was through one of the sisters Yes, and in this Louisiana. was one of the nuns, <laughs> yeah. and she was quite hilarious, and she arranged it, and sure enough, I stayed in the old chateau, Chateau, and I learned French. But I went from one cow pile to the next because I told my mother, I said, Well, I'm going back to a pile. Of she said, It was the garland. It all starts from she. <laughs> but you did get to Paris. Right, but I did get to Paris, but eventually I had to go and stay in Normandy, and I stayed in the old chateau, and it was fabulous. And the Saunier's, that's a northern yeah. name. And it's Normandy. a northern name. Yeah. So I, I, you know, when you, you talk about the neon wrapping incandescent yeah. with, the, with the incandescent bulbs, and you talk about that image of the screen door right. and the night and the yeah. light and attracting the bulbs. And you see, I would re meet caged men from this area. Mm -hmm. And when I was old and I came to Red Christmas, how's your sauce? Sauce. Meaning, I thought, what did they mean? Now? They meant, what did I cook? Mm -hmm. What was I good at? Keith is a very good cook, by the way. <laughs> and, and so I'd have to explain what I made. He says, mine's better, but I'm going to try yours. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it created an interesting bond, and it was very important. And as I said, both my parents had their eccentric lifestyles. They both had businesses, and they ran them in very different ways. 
My dad had a hardware store, and my dad rarely left his rocking chair that my grandmother... In, in the store? In the store. Okay. And at the bottom of the chair were just stacks of books, all kinds of books, because <laughs> he read constantly. And someone would come in the store and they'd say, Joe, je veux, in the dialect, this screw, and this, and he'd say, third shelf to the right. Leave the money on the register. I'm busy. <laughs> and this was how it was set up. And at the same time, my dad kept care of my aunt Evangeline, who checked on the leper colony. She had a son that had scarlet fever, and so he had the mentality of six. Yeah. But my dad took him on as a kind of someone that he would look after right. during the day. And this guy, Bosco was his, his nickname, Bosco. Bosco. He would, became this amazing pool chart. And so people would come in to place bets and stuff on the pool game. So it became a very interesting sort of community that way. You talked about going back to Louisiana yeah. when your parents were ill. Yeah. Well, and they, they were starting to die then, yeah. you know. But all the things you found there and then later incorporated, yeah. I think so. a couple yes. of the pieces actually have well, you see, equipped pieces yeah. from the hardware store. You see, here. from the hardware so, store. Yeah. And then from my mom had a, a flower business. She had a flower shop business. Yeah. And she secretly loved politics. <laughs> she really wanted to be a politician. She would have been a good one. Right. And so she had this thing with the mayor of the town. His name was Mr. Kazan. And Mr. Kazan ran the Kazan Hotel. You had a hotel? Yeah. We had a brick hotel in town. <laughs> and so he would ask my mother, now look, are you coming to the town meeting as May Sonia or May Ledoux? She says, no, it's going to be May Ledoux. <laughs> We're dealing with this here now. So that was her maiden day. Yeah. yeah. Different story. She says, I want two lanes in town. No cows. We're tired of walking through cow street. <laughs> so you get rid of the two lanes, and I will build a youth center in the town. And both happened. She built a youth center for a dollar a brick. And then, of course, the same Mary says, and who are you going to get to play at this? So, well, you know, your kids and my kids are not going to dance to this white rock and roll. <laughs> They're going to want Clifton Chenier and his sister to sing. So we're going to have them sing. Is that? But he oh. says they're black. <laughs> she says, black schmack. We are going to have them. And <laughs> they did sing. And it was fabulous. The youth center was a great hit. Great. And they built it for 50 cents a brick. <laughs> and where Clifton lived was really only 20 miles away. He lived in Opelousas. And his music was famous through the world. It was called Zodico music. Zodico. Yeah. Became famous. And they became pals. And she told him about the union and everything. And it became a working kind of relationship. It was very interesting. And that's when Lana picked up on She says, well, we have to have footage of the flocking of the car. Brilliant. And that's how this all started. But I, I have a question. You know, your earlier works, Keith, yeah. uh, when we're fabrics and um, gauzy fabrics yeah. and strings and yeah. so how did that transition from those kind of works to the neon well when i was first in new york i wanted to make something with neon and the big neon companies would not deal with me mm -hmm. they would say we'll deal with the company who's dealing with us but we won't deal with the individual artist mm -hmm. so i had found 
in the yellow pages, a neon man in Harlem, a black man. And I had asked, I called him up and I said, look, I want to build a piece of neon that's the shape of a half moon. Yeah, and he says, good. When do you want me to start? And so right away, I went up and saw him, and he built the, uh, it was like just a half circle of neon. That's a piece we saw in the film, yeah. yeah. Yes. And that was shown at the Pace Gallery. And started the idea of flocking the car. It was having this shape. Come right. around a circle. Yeah. yeah. And there's a limited palette in neon, I would say. Yes. It's not infinite. Yes. yes. And then because I of built. The gas. Yeah. Neon is yeah. the color. And neon is. Actually. Well, there's a second thing. Neon is trap gas. Red neon is, is neon. Blue neon is called argon. Argon. And yeah. that's another gas. And it's a combination of these two. And in the Ebola virus, there are two colors of light and they're red and blue. Mm. And so when I saw these first drawings, I realized, well, this is the image I have to go with. So we went with this, and it was a big success, and that's when my mother wanted now for them to walk separately. And she said, well, that's not gonna happen. And so it changed a lot of things in the community, and it was very positive. Because these women, these black women she sang with, some of them were opera trained. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, the choir became this amazing thing. Mm -hmm. It sounded like the Gloria was like this magical sort of ball. And that's what led to me talking to Lana about this and us deciding to do well, we are hoping that we can continue yeah, right. that, to um, make a more full documentary. The, and we haven't even gotten to the ant that ran the movie theater. But right, for, right. <laughs> right. But I think I, I've never known an artist who is quite so articulate. giving and articulate yeah. about his right. growing up. And yeah. it is such a part of your work that well, it's an enormous honey, gift. Nothing else there in the country. <laughs> but it's an enormous <laughs> gift to us to see that. And I yeah. can only say... Yeah. We must go to Memphis yeah. and finish this. And I we'll spent a lot of time here alone. again to do this. You know, kids don't. I never heard the term play date. <laughs> My mother would open the door. She said, "See you guys at supper." <laughs> and that was the play date. Hilarious. I, does anyone have any questions you might want to ask? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm curious about the process. Yes. Because you, your sketches are very precise. Yes. And you talk about when you work with the welder, it becomes more intuitional when, when, you, when you go yes. three-dimensional. Right? Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, the thing is, three dimensions, and don't forget light, it alters very much your perception of an object. It starts right there. Your perception of seeing is different. And having the neon in the flock car all of a sudden gave it this amazing, mystical, ghost-like look, which Lana looked and she says, well, this, we have, to, <laughs> we have to have this. And that was how the film, I think, one of the concepts of the film mm -hmm. began. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I'm still very happy with it. So, Here's yeah. a question over here. Good evening, Mr. Sanye. Good evening. Good. Oh, I know Winfield, yeah. So I have to ask, how's your sauce? My sauce <laughs> is actually pretty good. I'll bet it is. Um, I have the good fortune of being one of the docents here. <laughs> and um, our education and training for your exhibit was really wonderful. Wonderful. And I understand that when you were at Rutgers, yes, pursuing your MFA, yes, the faculty included Roy Lichtenstein, yes. um, Robert Morris, and sometimes Yoko Ono, yes, 
Could you tell us how a faculty like that inspired your work and may have directed you towards the yes. sculpture that you've created? Well, first of all, in Yoko's case, Yoko was a member of Fluxus, and Fluxus is an artist group that was very popular at Rutgers because our head of the sculpture department, Robert Watts, was a member of Fluxus. And the Fluxus artists were constantly at Rutgers. These were the artists who promoted early happenings and early art and people and poetry related events. And that's how that happened. And I met Yoko as someone who was participating in some of the events of the artists studying under Robert Watts who was also a member of Fluxus. Fluxus was very important in the East at that point for many young artists as well as teachers. Yeah. And also at Rutgers then, with your, you worked with a, a professor of African art. Yes. And then I also had the, uh, in those days you could still have a fellowship going to an to teach at an art school. Mm -hmm. And I had to assist a professor when I was going to Rutgers. And I was assigned a professor who taught African art. And I met with him and I said, look, I don't know anything about African art. Mm -hmm. He says, oh, that's easy. First of all, we have the best slide collection on the East Coast. And I have the best music collection of African art. Uh -huh. So you're going to start your class by showing the portraits of African tribes. And you're going to also... With the music? You're going to play the music. Yeah. And this young man happened to be Sidney Janice's son, <laughs> and who was also connected to the art world. And I just, I just lucked out. And I said, Sydney, what I was, this is what you're going to do. You play the music, you show the slides, and uh, by the end of the class, you're going to know a lot about African art. <laughs> well, I did this, and my classes were overloaded. <laughs> they were just, and he said, you see what I told you? You talk like you're an artist, and you talk like being an artist making work, and that's your job. And so it made for a wonderful situation, and we're still friends. So it was a wonderful learning process. Are there any other questions? I just think, Lana, we're going to all meet a year from now, maybe. How much time do you need? To <laughs> we need much more time and yeah. funding. Yeah. <laughs> funding, we'll, we'll do a go fund. One more question, right. Nathan. Wasn't leprosy contagious? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Leprosy was contagious until penicillin. It, we had leprosy all the way up and down the East Coast. They had it on the West Coast. It was something that the culture lived with since biblical times. So it was around. It's only through penicillin that leprosy has been killed. And they always assumed in Louisiana that because we had the marsupial, that and it's earth bearing, boring, that the marsupial might offer the key to solving leprosy, but it in fact was penicillin. Take up everyone that had leprosy and kind of isolated Oh, well, uh, lepers were uh, put in boxcars, in trains, and, and shipped down to the leper colony and left in the boxcar. And then they were finally moved into the leper colony buildings, and the boxcars were burned. Mm -hmm. So you were allowed to visit? Yes. My aunt, <laughs> Well, one of, one of my aunts, my aunt Evangelum, was a, a very unusual woman who wore many hats. And she f felt it was her duty to support the lepers at the leper colony in Louisiana, which was in Carville. It's an old plantation. 
and the slave quarters of the plantation had been converted into the leper colony. And so they were beautifully finished and the lepers were there wrapped in their garb and we... Um, so it was totally isolated. Yeah. We went for, to meet the lepers and to see the houses. And, as a mission of charity. As a mission yeah. of charity. So it was very interesting, that part. I don't know. This is a... But at the same time, we were terrified. <laughs> we were terrified. But we went, and it was amazing. And my aunt was just out there. You know, she would go there. She'd talk to the chief leper, and they would discuss political things and whatever. It was quite amazing. And then... Lana somehow we got into descriptions of this and Lana I we're said talking you know, about your background and, yeah. and we wanted to yeah. actually go to Mamu and yes. to present it to film, remember? Yes. And so I grew up in this town, luckily with these liberal parents, but up to a point. So it was them doing this that allowed me to have a much more open attitude, especially about blacks and whites in America, but even more so about leprosy as an international illness in the world. And this is what Lana always felt would make a great film. Yes. Well, we wait. We all make a pact and come back. Right. We're going to see this. Thank you very, very much.